found a really good one. This must be less. Yes, it will be less. <laughs> just smile, yeah. just smile as you go by. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming you. for our presentation today. I am Lori Grant with the Wild Safe BC. You may have seen me at various events and booths around town, trying to spread the word, educate the community on keeping wildlife wild and community safe. Today, I'm just going to have a quick talk about the local ungulates, and then I will pass the presentation on to the main event. And uh, please help yourself to back to treats and beverages. So, um, feeding wild ungulates, why it isn't the answer. Keeping wildlife wild is BC policy, and it makes sense. When humans provide food to wild animals, it changes their wildness, no matter what species is being fed. There are justifiable reasons to feed wild animals, such as to attract them for capture, but these situations are rare. The consequences of feeding a wild animal unnatural types and amounts of feed can range from mildly irritating behavior to catastrophic health issues. So understanding the reasons behind this policy is important. Opportunities to come close to wild ungulates are rare, anywhere else but ground horses. <laughs> <laughs> but rewarding, especially when the animals are unaware of humans. Habitation or increased animal tolerance for close contacts with humans occurs when the animals are fed and with this comes unplanned consequences, which include, uh, just a little background, wild ungulates have specialized seasonal food requirements, which they fulfill by eating a wide variety of foods from their environment. Well-intentioned people may quite literally be killing with kindness when they provide unnatural food items to wild ungulates. All ungulates are ruminants with specific bacteria in their digestive tracts, specialized to digest their specific diet. It can take weeks for an ungulate digestive system to adjust to new food items. Rapid changes, especially at critical times such as the fall, can result in death, even with their stomachs full of food. Dry feeds such as hay grains or pellet types are preferred for domestic livestock and meant to be used with abundant fresh water. Without ready access to water, dry feed can impact in the digestive tract and kill wild ungulates. Grains, pelleted feeds, or surplus fruits are high in carbohydrates, protein, energy, and even small amounts can cause digestive upsets that can lead to diarrhea, bloating, and significant damage to their digestive tracts. Another effect is the population. Wild ungulate populations are naturally limited by a number of factors, including the amount and quantity of food their habitat supplies. Animals in poor body condition or with high nutritional needs, such as the young, may die when natural environment conditions and appropriate foods are not present in the right amount and quality to sustain them. Feeding of wild ungulates by human increases animal density in the short term by concentrating animals around the more worse. Density increases may also occur over time if the feeding results in improved body condition or more frequent reproduction. Increased density results in increased compensation for natural resources with other animals that share the range. Other consequences of increased animal density include increased risk me, increased, <laughs> increased risk of infectious diseases. Disease transmissions and outbreaks occur when animals in close and frequent contact with others transmit organisms more easily than when at a lower density. For example, across North America where high ungulate density contributes to pneumonia in wild sheep, tuberculosis, rosaliosis, and with deer chronic risk. Higher stress on individual animals, uh, the stress can reduce their immune function, making these animals more susceptible to infections. And in BC, viral papillomas, or warts in deer, appear to be increased in the urban areas where deer numbers are unnaturally high. It can also decrease their body condition. They may not grow, or weight gain to reduce feed quality or quantity may occur. Uh, there will be, of course, increased conflicts with humans. With increased habituation, animals learn to take human-supplied feed. 
losing their natural awareness of humans. And habituated ungulates can be aggressive toward humans and can you help us find the in the spring when the protected their young fawns and the fawns are species. And of course increase more vehicle collisions, causing injuries for death for humans and the wildlife. There's also an increased mortality from wild predators and humans when they're concentrated, concentrated, so it's much easier for the predators to find them. And some ecological effects are documented across North America and include disruption of normal wild animal movement patterns, alteration of the native plant community structure with reduced diversity and abundance, introduction, introduction and or expansion of invasive exotic plants and degradation of the local habitat. Some alternatives to feeding, because people care about the animals, so better ways to help the wild ungulates. Uh, they benefit when we preserve and restore the natural habitat and reduce human-caused disturbances, leaving them alone to conserve their energy and survive severe winter conditions. Your best way to help the wild ungulates survive in severe weather is to maintain high-quality habitat year-round. If animals enter the winter in good condition, will survive persistent deep snow and cold temperatures, even in well-functioning natural ecosystems. However, some animals succumb during winter months, and this is natural. Winter mortality helps keep the ungulate populations in balance with the available habitat. Another way to help them in the winter is to avoid disturbing them. Animals must conserve their energy to survive in winter conditions. Human-related causes of disturbance, such as from recreation, like snowmobiles, chasing by domestic animals can result in wild ungulates expending valuable energy. And this information can be found on the Wildlife Health website. Now, of course, this time of year is a specific concern for wild ungulates because they're in rut. So from October through December, the animals are mating and therefore have only that on their mind. So they're not as cautious as they might normally be. Uh, I travel from here up to Rilkoffs where I live on a daily basis and weekly there's blood stains on the road from collisions. And almost on a daily basis I have to slam on my brakes at some point along that trip to avoid having a collision myself. Um, so drivers are advised to watch out for deer and other animals located on the local roads and highways, particularly along Highway 3. The critical times to watch for wildlife are between 5 and 8 a.m. and 5 and 7 p.m. when the animals are most active. But of course in ground works it can be only um, However, it's more difficult to see them at those periods of time. The light levels are changing and the traffic volumes are higher as people drive to and from work. Although collision for wildlife can happen any place and any time in the West Kootenays, as I mentioned, the highest risks are October through December. And Barb uh, Waters, my boss at the BC Conservation Foundation, indicated that there can be two or three collisions a day during these months. Annually in BC Southern Interior, about two people are killed and 180 people are injured in animal-related vehicle collisions. Recent information from the Ministry of Transportation and Infrastructure places several stretches of highway on the top 10 list of highway corridors where high numbers of animal collisions occur. Uh, you can also visit um, the Wildlife Collision Prevention Program and that will list some tips and ideas and I've also printed out some <coughs> brochures at the back on the feeding wild ungulates, frequently asked questions about wildlife vehicle collisions. And what drivers should do if they have a collision with wildlife. Uh, it depends, of course, on the type and condition of the road, the amount of traffic, traffic, and the type of animal and condition of the driver. My last trip home from Penticton, two moose ran in front of me on the highway, just up by Phoenix, and then climbed the really steep bank beside me. So it's not only deer that we may run into around here. Uh, the, what I've been reading on all the American and Canadian sites is if a deer is coming and you have no choice, don't swerve. Your likelihood of having an accident or causing an accident with another vehicle is more dangerous than 
unfortunately hitting the animal. If you do hit an animal, pull off the road, turn on your hazard lights, illuminate the animal if you can with your headlights if it's dark. You may choose to carefully approach the animal to determine if it's dead or injured. If it is injured, back off. A wounded animal can be very dangerous. You're not required to put an injured animal out of its misery. You may choose to remove a dead animal from the road so it doesn't present a uh, hazard to other drivers, but only remove it if it's safe to do so and you're physically capable of doing so. I got a report yesterday on my email because I get Google alerts about deer all over the North America, and a gentleman who was trying to remove it got hit by a car. And he was so it's really important to make sure. Um, I inspect your vehicle to see if it's safe to continue driving. Call the RCMP if the damage is over a thousand or there's any human injuries. Call the conservation officer service if there's a dead or injured animal to report. And the number in BC, I'll have it on the list there. And uh, report any vehicle damage to your insurance company. And um, if in Grand Forks, if you're in the city, you can make a uh, a call to the city to remove the deer if you're outside the city limits and the time. Any questions or concerns? Thank you so much. And now on to the show. Today we have a wonderful group of volunteers. Sue and Gary McDougall have traveled all the way from Penticton, volunteering their time and energy to uh, share their stories about why we and uh, materials that can be purchased. Uh, Tanya Wilson is our local Lyme disease, local fundraiser for Lyme disease. She's brought the delicious treats at the back and she can be accessed locally if anybody has any concerns locally. And uh, today we're really pleased to welcome Mr. Jim Wilson, who's the founder and president of the Canadian Lyme Disease oh, Foundation. He's been researching Lyme disease for many years and uh, started the foundation in 2003. And he's volunteered his time all the way from West Coloma. So welcome. Well, thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for coming today. Uh, all of you have heard something about Lyme disease by now in the media and elsewhere. Uh, it is the fastest growing emerging infectious disease globally. Uh, it's here. It's not a new bacteria. It's, it's been around for uh, millions of years. And uh, in fact, in, in 19, uh, early 90s, they found the um, ice man in uh, the ice of the Alps, and I don't know if you recall that. And anyhow, recently, within the last uh, several years, they did an autopsy on the ice man, and using today's technology of uh, ability to check DNA, uh, the only bacterial organism they were able to isolate out of the uh, mummy was this bacterial Lyme disease, and it's, that's the bacteria right there. It's a spiral-shaped organism that is very efficient at moving through our fluid and our tissue, and which, which makes it also a very difficult disease to treat because it's about to be disseminated throughout the body. But the trick to Lyme disease is early treatment. Could you speak just a tad bit louder? <clears throat> okay. Thank you. Thank you. Is that better? Much better. Okay. Um, so, uh, how do you get Lyme disease? Well, it's, it's right now the most efficient vector to human, from animal to human, is the uh, tick. And uh, our, our motto is that no tick is a good tick. Not all ticks transmit Lyme disease. Uh, there are certain species that are uh, efficient at transmitting it to humans. There are other species that can carry the tick, but they're very poor at transmitting it to humans for various reasons. Um, now, the, the, um, the, the spiroketal bacteria called Borrelia, 
and there's multiple strains of Borrelia, not just in Canada, but in Canada, but in North America and globally. So, and because we're we're a, a generation of travelers, uh, we could be be exposed to many different types of strains of Borrelia in our lifetime. Uh, unfortunately, the current Canadian testing model is only able to detect one strain of one species and its very closest relatives. Uh, Health Canada recently um, put out a paper that uh, indicated that we have another strain called Borrelia miyamotoi uh, from coast to coast to coast in Canada, and there currently is no human test for it. So it really is a clinical diagnosis uh, that blood tests can only uh, inform yeah. on, especially uh, when they're positive. Now, uh, <clears throat> these ticks that carry the disease uh, are carried around by our friendly migratory birds. So uh, there's been a lot of emphasis, and you may have seen it in the literature of, of the provincial and federal uh, um, health care uh, awareness campaigns over the years that they emphasize, oh, there's a, there's Lyme in this area, in this area, in this area, and therefore if you haven't been to those areas, the likelihood of you having Lyme, despite the fact you're sick with all these symptoms, is very low. Um, that's kind of ridiculous when, when you look at how the, these ticks are transplanted in the hundreds of millions each season by our migratory birds. Uh, so if you get robins in the spring, you very possibly have Lyme disease in your yard, in your mice, in, in your chipmunks, in the squirrels, in the raccoons, and in the Okanagan Valley, in the quail, and in the marmots. So for, for diagnosis for the, the last two and a half decades to be tied to somebody knowing whether you've been in an endemic area has really put us back many, many years. And uh, it's the wrong way of looking at a disease that is spread randomly. Now, in, in human cases, sporadic cases of what we now call Lyme disease have been reported since the early 70s. Uh, and you can, you can see them there. Uh, so Ontario, Ontario, Alberta, Quebec. Um, we've also had similar cases in, in British Columbia, just poorly documented. Uh, in fact, um, in um, the early, late 80s, uh, a, a registered nurse, Diane Kindry, uh, contracted Lyme disease. Her father was a physician in Squamish, BC. She and her father and the then head of vector-borne disease at the BC Center for Disease Control, Dr. Satyan Banerjee, started investigating Lyme in BC because Dr. Banerjee had started seeing it come through his lab in 1985. And um, so he was concerned about it. Dr. Kendry, when he recognized, or, or when, when his daughter was diagnosed with Lyme disease, not by him, but by another doctor, then he started to recognize, so, well, I've got quite a few people in my practice with this set of symptoms. And so he was able to start uh, painting a clinical profile of what a Lyme, typical Lyme disease patient looks like, and was able to offer a, a lot of help to an awful lot of people uh, that the first Lyme Society or Foundation in Canada was started by D uh, Diane Kendry and her father um, in 1989. It was registered as the Lyme Borreliosis Society of BC. The following year, the Lyme Disease Association of Ontario was formed. Um, and since then, it's evolved into the Canadian Lyme Disease Foundation and many, many support groups right across Canada who work together. And um, so, so it's, it's not, I know we've only been really hearing about it for the last you know, several years, but it's been around in BC for a long time. 
and you can guarantee it predates the 70s. They just didn't know what it was. And if you look back in, in our medical literature, uh, I've read back personally as far as 1911, where they were finding these strange looking spirochetal bacteria in the cerebrospinal fluid of, of people with MS. And in fact, the literature was, was uh, quite um, extensive on that particular spirochetal bacteria right up until around 1960. In fact, on our website, if you go there in our CanLime search string and type in multiple sclerosis, you'll bring up uh, several of those older articles showing that they used to, at that time, called it spirochetal my myelophthora. Um, but by the 1960s, they decided MS was strictly an autoimmune disease, no infection allowed. And so they ended discussion about, uh, about bacterial cause to, to MS. So that's just one illness that has a history of these spirochetal bacteria with it. Um, now, in, in, uh, uh, here's the number of different strains we know we have in BC. And um, we're only testing for one strain of this. And it's not even a wild strain that are used in the kits that our BC government purchases. It's a, it's a laboratory strain, and it's a strain that hails from the eastern seaboard of the United States. One thing we do know about Borrelia bacteria from the research is that it tends to localize fairly quickly. So what may have arrived here 20 years ago may not be detectable using the tests from 20 years ago. So we're using tests from 20 years ago looking for a laboratory strain. So we, as a result, have very few positive cases confirmed at our BC Center for Disease Control. Um, <clears throat> now, this, this particular newer, newly discovered Borrelia miyamotoi, uh, uh, most of our uh, ticks that transmit Lyme disease come from the north-south migratory bird flyway. So from California, Northern California, Oregon, and, and further south even. Um, now, in, in a study, they found Borrelia miyamotoi was equally as prevalent in the ticks in, in California as was the strains of Borrelia burgdorferi. So you would expect to find the same here. Uh, currently, um, they're telling us that's not the case. Uh, but as a result of, of history with them, we are now doing our own studies and working with uh, um, researchers who are going to start studying uh, and reporting on, on the, what, what bacteria are in the guts of our, not just BC ticks, but ticks right across Canada. In fact, one of our board members, uh, Janet Sperling, is doing her PhD on exactly that, the microbiome of the gut of the tick across Canada. Um, <clears throat> this is an older graph, uh, and it was uh, created by the World Health Organization in 2006, and combined with the US CDC morbidity or mortality report. Um, there's the United States. Now you get countries like Austria. This is an anomaly in so much as they used a broader interpretation of the tests. As it turns out, they may have been the only country that had it right years ago. Because uh, you, know, you can see Canada, when this was done, it isn't even on the radar. Yet we have the highest incidence in the world of all those diseases that, that people with Lyme disease have previously been labeled with. So, multiple sclerosis, lupus, chronic fatigue syndrome, fibromyalgia, Alzheimer's, Lou Gehrig's disease, and forms of Parkinsonism, various forms of uh, arth arth arthritic conditions. Um, <clears throat> but, very cleverly, we don't have any Lyme, and we didn't. But that's, again, a result of the medical leadership and their approach to saying this, I don't see that we have Lyme disease here. And, and that's what they've been doing for decades. 
and um, we are trying to insist now at the highest levels uh, in Canada that they substantiate any information that they give to the public with level one evidence, not the opinion that they've been running our health care system on for the last 25 years relative to Lyme disease. Um, <clears throat> now, uh, United States in August, uh, August 19th of 2013 issued a press release stating that, oops, we had it wrong. Instead of 30,000 cases annually, it's 300,000 cases annually. So you take that and go back year after year after year after year and look at how many people just in the, in the United States have been misdiagnosed, mislabeled, uh, end up either deceased or on disability, um, taking very expensive medications that they should not be taking. Um, so it's, it's a huge problem. The financial impact alone of not diagnosing Lyme disease properly to our healthcare budgets that are overly stressed is, is, uh, is enormous. Here's, uh, in the memory of uh, Dr. Kindry and, and both Dr. Banerjee, when I started CanLyme in, in 2003, the very first thing I did was I scoured our universities and whatnot or anybody who was doing anything on Lyme disease, and I invited them to join my board of directors. Uh, and I had read literature that Dr. Banerjee had published, but he had retired uh, six years earlier. But I hunted him down at home and said, join for my board, and he did, very happily and very enthusiastically, because when he retired, he was trying to get them to wake up, that we've got a bigger problem here than we recognize. So he joined my board, and, and uh, th these are um, areas where they discovered the Lyme ticks early in the uh, 1990s throughout BC. And um, as you can see, uh, the, the, and, and the reason there's such a concentration here is partially due to the fact that that's where Dr. Banerjee and Dr. Kendry live. It was more inconvenient for them to travel to other locations, and there was less awareness having people send them the ticks that they were looking for in those regions. So um, now Dr. Kendry was also the doctor that eventually di uh, diagnosed me in 1994 as having Lyme disease. I was very sick. Uh, I contracted. Lyme, uh, I can pretty well identify when I contracted it in the, in the spring of 1991 in Dartmouth, Nova Scotia. I was cleaning out our backyard uh, down to the lake to, to get ready to sell the house to come to BC. And uh, I got this big deer rash around my navel. Never thought, gave it two thoughts. It stayed there for about three weeks and went away. Um, <clears throat> then, uh, well, three, three and a half months later, we had sold the house and we were starting our drive across Canada. And I found suddenly, gee, I had to pull over for two hours and go to sleep. And that was really unlike me. I was a very physically fit. We had just won the Eastern Canadian Men's uh, Ball, and, I, and we had won the Provincials Ball, and uh, I was in really good shape playing on two different ball teams and practicing three times a week. And um, I went from being in wonderfully good shape to hardly being able to walk or function by the end of that year. And, and, and it progressed from there into a whole series of strange symptoms. My legs became rubber. My brain left me. Uh, I drooled when I talked. I choked on my food. I had muscle wasting in my hands. Um, it, it, it was. It was an absolute horrible uh, nightmare that, that for, for that several period of years. Then, um, after the uh, doctors finished with me and even took out my lymph nodes and sent them away for biopsy because my lymph nodes were swollen like golf balls, and uh, the lymph node biopsy came back in 1993 as a normal functioning lymph node fighting an infection of unknown origin. 
So even with that information, and the fact that the doctors couldn't figure it out, in the end, they decided, oh, it's all in your head. <laughs> you know, so uh, that, that's when we got uh, my wife and myself got a little angry. And my wife, by then, we were in, in Kelowna, and she went to the Kelowna Library and started uh, researching chronic disease. And in there, she found a book that a woman had written in the 70s. And in there was a picture of that rash that I had around my navel years earlier. And that was the first time that we tied that rash to, to my diagnosis, got excited, took the book and everything, went into my doctor. You know, we don't have Lyme in Canada, that's not what it is. <coughs> and, um, so in the back of the book, there was a phone number to the New York uh, Lyme Borreliosis Society. So I called that number and asked them, do you have any doctors or, or in Western Canada or Western United States? They gave me Dr. Kinder's name because he had published papers along with Dr. Banerjee on the prevalence of Lyme in British Columbia. And uh, apparently doctors don't read their own medical journal because they had a, a very good paper in, in the 1994 BC Medical Journal about the, about the prevalence of Lyme disease. <coughs> and um, <clears throat> But it's funny, we still have today doctors telling patients we don't have Lyme in BC. And that is absolutely the responsibility of the medical leadership. If they are that poor at educating our doctors on something so serious and so prevalent in our globe now, that gives you an indication of just how poorly managed our healthcare system is. There's lots of money being made from the drug companies not diagnosing Lyme disease. There's a ton of money being made developing a drug for every symptom of disease, managing disease, not treating the cause of disease. That whole medical model changed in the late 50s, early, early 60s to becoming one of management of symptoms. They figure they can keep everybody going <clears throat> on three or four drugs a day for the rest of the life. It's an excellent boardroom profit model. It's a horrible health care model. <clears throat> and uh, this is uh, <clears throat> a map from, and this is fairly old research too. This is from Dr. One of, uh, Dr. Nick Ogden from the Public Health Agency of Canada, one of his older papers. Um, so as you can see, there, there is Lyme disease everywhere. And again, this is only reflecting what they're confirming using that for test. So those numbers you can multiply many, many times over again when they start actually looking for the type of strains that we actually have in Canada. Um, you're only going to accidentally run into Borrelia burgdorferi strain B31 which is what they're testing for. <clears throat> so you get into the symptoms of Lyme disease. Well, symptoms are strain and species related, just as the flu is. Uh, you get the flu, some year it can be a very severe flu, other years it can be very, very mild. And, and some years it's more head cold, other years it's more, more chest and, and achy muscles and everything. <clears throat> Just, just as with Lyme disease, uh, there's, we believe that the, the wide difference in how we see patients present with their symptoms is strain related. And there are pockets that we've start, started to recognize where there's some very severe strains, other pockets where there's very mild strains, and then everything in between. So that, that is a research thing that has to be done. Unfortunately, there's, <clears throat> it's almost laughable what we're putting into Lyme disease research here, yet, uh, yet we have two million Canadians in, uh, in any given year who could fit the diagnosis of, of Lyme disease right now. We don't know what the percentage of that two million population of very sick people actually have Lyme disease, we do know the percentage is, is significant. And we did a very rough calculation <clears throat> using only 2% of 
we very quickly got up to uh, in the billions of dollars in, in unnecessary cost to our health care system. That's not even taken into consideration the impact on the quality of life for the patient. I can't <clears throat> it's not taken into consideration the um, loss of uh, employees. Uh, our out of door workers are the highest get at risk. So we're, we're now getting approached by well companies, forestry companies, because they're getting so many of their employees sick. Uh, asking us to provide material to, to and, and occasionally come and talk to them. Um, <clears throat> so it's, it's impacting our workforce. Our workforce is already aging. And uh, you, you throw something like this into the mix and uh, you know we could be headed for quite a, quite a severe financial impact just from that, let alone the uh, cost of the health care system. <clears throat> So now this rash that I got, uh, again, if you've seen any of the government posters or articles or anything, it's always accompanied with this nice big airbrushed picture of the bright bullseye rash. And so, and in their literature that they give to doctors, they consistently say 70 to 80% of people with Lyme disease are gonna get this bright bullseye rash. Uh, <clears throat> the truth is, that ain't the case. But when doctors are operating in, in a 15 minute appointment and they've got you know, patient after patient after patient, they operate on points of quick recall. What do they remember about Lyme disease? The big bullseye rash. And if you walk in there and don't have the big bullseye rash, you don't have Lyme disease. And patients are told that all the time. Current research, however, shows us that <clears throat> uh, only about 20% of people with Lyme disease will get a rash of any kind. Now, of those that do, only 9% take that nice bullseye form. So that's missing a big chunk of the population right off the bat. They have the, the authorities and the medical leadership and the College of Physicians and Surgeons and all of those people res uh, responsible for educating our doctors have known that for years because we've provided it. Yet to get them to change it at the uh, provincial levels has been an almost impossible task. And it's the provinces who are responsible for the delivery of our health care. Um, <clears throat> federally, we are starting to make some headway. On that and, and there have been having a meeting quarterly now in teleconferences with the uh, executives of the Public Health Agency of Canada and, and things are happening. We've got uh, Bill C-442 uh, which has passed through the House of Commons. It's our National Lyme Disease Strategy Act. It's now renamed as uh, 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 National Framework for Lyme Disease. And um, <clears throat> Anyhow, it passed unanimously, all party support through the House. It's now in the Senate. I was there in, in Ottawa on the day of the shootings. Uh, I was to testify before the Senate that day. And, and of course, as a result of that really tragic uh, e e series of events that unfolded that day, uh, it's been delayed and, and we hope to get back there in, in August. But we expect that Bill C-442 will also have e equally as broad support in the Senate as it did in the House. And it's very hard to get a private member's bill passed. And Elizabeth may put this bill to together. And um, uh, in, in, in conjunction with, with, with ourselves, uh, we offered some input. <clears throat> and uh, for a bill like that, to get all party support it is quite unique in Canadian uh, politics. And that's only because there's so many people across Canada now and the MPs are hearing it all the time from their constituents. The absolute hell they've gone through. Not only from the disease, but they're victimized, victimized twice. They're victimized by the disease and then by our healthcare system. It's all in your head. You don't have Lyme disease. 
<clears throat> we, we've had young women told many times, go home, you're just trying, you're just trying to get attention. And here's these girls who can't even get out of bed, or, or, or they're having heart issues, uh, or, or other severe uh, medical problems. And, and doctors have the nerve to tell them that this is uh, just you looking for attention. And um, so here's, here's the uh, types of things that uh, mind can cause. Brain, th brain thinking dysfunction. So in my case, um, my brain got so distorted I couldn't recall what I had just read. And I, I would reread it, lose it, reread it, lose it. Um, um, <clears throat> the, uh, I, and I also got so bad at one particular point one day that um, I went in, got in my car one day to go somewhere. My wife found me sitting out there half an hour later. I was uh, 38 years old. I had no idea I had to put the key in the ignition. That's how badly it affected my brain. That scared the living bejesus out of me. I thought I was in the full throes of dementia at 38 years of age. It was, it was probably the most horrific day of my life because of what had just occurred. Um, <clears throat> so your memory can go, your concentration. It can cause bipolar symptoms. It can cause schizophrenia. Hallucinations, both auditory and visual hallucinations. Uh, headaches from mild to severe migraine headaches. Uh, it can cause poor blood flow because the blood thickens. And so often we find people who eventually do get diagnosed with Lyme disease, they've been on blood thinners for years and whatnot, along with all of their other symptoms. Uh, there can be many different forms of arthritic system, uh, symptoms, rheumatic symptoms. There can be uh, paralysis. Uh, there, there can also be blindness or severe eye, eyesight issues. Um, muscle spasms, seizures. Uh, there's a film out called Under Our Skin. I'd recommend that everybody watch that. Uh, and um, it, it, it'll show you just how severe the symptoms can be from this disease. And then once you've watched that movie, which came out in 2008, now you can go watch part two, Under Our Skin Emergence. And then you can watch and see how with the proper treatment, just how far back these people came to recover their life. And that, that's the most important thing is to realize this is a treatable, chronic, disabling disease. And if you don't treat it, you, your life is changed forever. And the health care costs for managing chronic disease in Canada are phenomenal. That two million population I, I uh, referred to of chronic disease patients in Canada are also the biggest single user group of our healthcare system. Because when you're sick, you're going back to the doctor. You know, you don't want to be sick. Can it kill you? Pardon me? Can it kill you? Lyme disease? Oh yes. It's yes. just a matter of time. No, no, it's not a matter of time. It's uh, there's a whole lot of different reasons. In fact, we don't even know the true mortality rate for, for Lyme disease. We do know that suicide is high. We do know that there are severe cardiac problems that can occur and cause death. Beyond that, we really don't know. In fact, we don't even know how many people are dying from heart-related Lyme disease. Um, only just yesterday, I posted on our website uh, that they, oh, Lyme card carditis can cause, uh, cause sudden death. Well, the patients and the physicians who have been in the inner circles trying to change healthcare system have been telling them that for two decades, but they, they just ignored it. Um, so the heart problems can range from just from mild palpitations, which is what I had, to absolute third degree heart blur, uh, block, which is what my daughter had who was diagnosed here in BC a decade after I contracted mine. Uh, as did other kids at her school. Um, <clears throat> she now, my daughter now has a permanent uh, pacemaker. She was diagnosed in 2001, and that's what prompted me to start the Canadian Lyme Disease Foundation. What are the odds of two members of one family 
uh, a decade apart, 5,000 kilometers apart, getting a disease we were told we didn't have. And so that was just too much of a co coincidence for me. And, and so I started the Canadian Lyme Disease Foundation, and what I found out shortly thereafter, uh, and I'll give you a, a, a bit of the first time I put the web page up for CanLime was in May of 2003. I had only 37 hits that entire month. By the end of December that year, we were getting 15,000 hits every day. And it was just uh, exponential there. Um, so it's, uh, it, it's, it's a, uh, a huge issue. It's gone un unrecognized for decades. Uh, again, it can cause bowel issues, pain, diarrhea, constipation. Uh, again, I mentioned the eyesight problems. Uh, so e even, even your other systems of the body, so your hormonal uh, production, hormone production, sexual function, um, your uh, secretion of, of um, other, uh, I'm not even sure what, how to phrase them, but the, uh, the function of your thyroid gland, of your uh, pituitary gland, all of those things can be adversely affected. And uh, a given analogy of Lyme disease, um, <clears throat> if you opened up 10 computers and let their motherboard be bare, and then you sprinkled water on every one of those 10 computers' motherboards, not one of those computers is going to have likely the identical problem from that. They're all going to have different symptoms, and that's just like the human. When you have a disease that enters our brain, our nervous system, it, we don't know what it's going to cause. So this is why it's such a wide presentation of symptoms. You can get a thorough, a fairly thorough uh, understanding of the symptoms of Lyme disease by just going to the front page of CanLyme and uh, under, right at the end of the first paragraph there's a link to the symptoms list and it's quite extensive. Um, now, <clears throat> how do you prevent it? Well, your uh, knowledge is 90% is of the battle. First thing is to realize that we have the ticks here that, that uh, will transmit Lyme disease. The numbers of ticks are increasing significantly. Um, so when you're outdoors, take precautions. If you're hiking, for example, stay in the middle of the path. Don't brush up against the, the edges of the path because ticks, when they're feeding, they like pathways because they sense CO2 of mammals. So you, everybody breathes out CO2. So they can sense where a pathway is by the, the, the remnants of CO2. So they go to the edges of these pathways and they crawl up, typically no higher than about 18 inches off the ground, at the edge of a blade of grass or a low brush, uh, and they'll stick their little feet out and their little feet at the ends of them are just like Velcro. And so they'll latch on to the first CO2 breathing mammal that goes along. And, and if it's you, then look out, because you could have a Lyme infected tick on you. Not every tick is carrying Lyme, but we honestly don't know. Uh, you can go from county to county and have wildly different infection rates in the tick population. So you never know. No, so our motto is no tick is a good tick. Treat them all as nasty, uh, with nature's dirty needle. Um, so D products are fairly successful. Uh, I know a lot of people uh, don't, who prefer not to use D products. Um, in those cases, I would say just spray the clothes around the entry points. So around your ankles, around your wrists, around your neck. Uh, anywhere where a tick can, uh, around the, the belt line, um, anywhere to prevent that tick from crawling in to where your skin is. 
Um, do not sit on logs. That's something that a study out of the uh, University of California showed us, is that uh, hunters who go out in the woods and, and sit on logs, they, their risk of exposure is phenomenally higher. It's about four times higher than, than somebody who doesn't go out and sit on logs, and that's because and ticks will. will um, and on the, the, the deadfall, and they, they get under the bark and they crawl around. It's, it's sort of a little uh, environment for them. So don't sit on logs. When, when uh, if any of you burn wood, when you're going gathering your wood, you have to be extremely cognizant of ticks. And uh, okay, you know, like they say, wear like colored clothing, uh, like colored clothing, because it is so much easier to see a tick on you if you've got something to contrast it against. If you're wearing dark clothes, you're not going to see that tick. Um, so be looking if you're hiking. Uh, have the person behind you watching your back for ticks. And then switch places with, with the person, whoever's in the lead. And then be constantly watching for ticks. And also, um, these little ticks, once you get home, Take your clothes off immediately if you've been outside hunting, hunting or gathering wood or anything. Um, throw your clothes in the dryer immediately. Do not put them in the washing machine. These little ticks will survive that washing machine every time. They will not survive 15 minutes of dry heat. So throw your clothes in the dryer. That'll kill them. If they go in the washing machine, they'll survive that flushing and everything and quite often they'll crawl out into your tub down onto your floor get into your baseboards and wait for you to come along when they're hungry they'll feed on you or your pet so it's in, it's it's very important it's a different environment now <laughs> in nature than it was 50 years ago we have to be much more cognizant of this problem with ticks. And uh, <clears throat> it's only going to get worse. The, the ticks are surviving over winter now at fantastic numbers compared to what they used to. And uh, Laurie's talk about the deer. Uh, deer are very good for overwintering ticks. So the, the ticks will uh, latch onto the deer. Um, they'll crawl under the fur. They'll lay eggs, and they will survive quite well. Also, they survive equally as easy without deer by crawling underneath the leaf litter, finding a crack in the ground so that the, the layer of decomposing leaf litter or grass provides heat from the decomposition. And so they're in a little crack in the ground underneath there, and uh, they've got the perfect little home to sit there for, for the winter. And even if they do get cold, they have a type of blood called hemolens that uh, is, is there. Uh, if anybody has ever had an outdoor fish tank, for example, you'll know that uh, if you have at least 18 inches of depth uh, in, your, in your outdoor fish tank, you can overwinter these fish because they'll just go to the bottom and, and keel over and go into a state of hibernation, but it's a frozen hibernation, uh, semi-frozen. And they'll survive. And then in the spring, once the ice to, uh, melts, these fish will come right back up. And, and you know, same with the tick; they have the same properties in there. But so. Um, <clears throat> Just be aware, and that's the reason that I do this and for the website and, and Canline, is to just raise people's awareness because you know, that's a big part of the battle, is knowing what you're up against. Um, so now, I'll open the floor. Has anybody got questions? Yes. Um, from what you've said, I'm, I'm understanding, and you can. this is where I want your, your uh, affirmation, is that a person with Lyme disease does not ha necessarily have all of those symptoms. Absolutely. They could have one. None, oh, none, no, oh, they will have one. Never just one. Yeah, but they will have combinations. Oh, right. So what we say, if you go to that link, yeah. you'll see that there's 76 or so. We'll say in, in there that if you have 20 or more, okay. you had better look at Lyme disease. 
Okay. Because it's a multi-system, and that's the one consistent thing about Lyme disease, is that it's a multi-system disease. So you're not going to only have cardiac problems. Yes. You're not going to only have arthritic problems. You're going to have neurologic problems, uh, brain fog, uh, arthritic, perhaps a lot of people don't get arthritis. Now it's another problem with our um, messaging to you know, the medical community and the public is quite often they'll, they'll say that you know, you're going to end up with Lyme arthritis. Well, not only is that poorly defined, what Lyme arthritis looks like, uh, depending on where you are, arthritis is not a big issue with Lyme disease. In the East, we're seeing more arthritis associated with Lyme. Than, than we are in the West. In the West, it's more neurological. We don't, it's not as cut and dried in that, as that. We do see arthritis here in the West, just not frequently. Um, but it is multi-system. So that's the one consistent thing about Lyme disease, is you're gonna have symptoms that cross several systems of the body, and that's what confuses the doctors. So that, that begins the never-ending specialist thing. So you have cardiac problems, your GP sends you to the cardiologist. While you're in the cardiologist, you're telling them about your uh, uh, neurological stuff. So you're going to see a neuro uh, neurologist. You're in the neuro uh, talking to the neurologist, and you're telling them about all the bowel problems you've been having. Off you go to a gastroenterologist. And uh, while you're there, you're telling about the, all the muscle pain and everything. And then you go to a rheumatologist. Tell him about all what's going on in your head. You may end up at a psychiatrist. <laughs> yeah. and, uh, nobody but, it, but nobody is looking at the whole picture and putting it together, which is exactly what you have to do with Lyme disease, is it's take the whole person and listen to them. But we have broken our medical system into little categories. And uh, nobody wants to deal with the whole person. Now, internists should be the, the, the specialty to do that. And we're trying to uh, get that in because an internist is more of the whole body person. Um, so there are some good internists who have uh, stepped up to the plate, not so in Canada. So tell us how you got well. Antibiotics. But how did you find someone that listened from that, that book? I called the New York Lyme Borreliosis Society. They directed me to Dr. Kendry. I called his office on a Friday afternoon. I was sitting in his office in Squamish from Kelowna on Monday morning. So there are doctors in British Columbia now? Do Dr. Kendry is, is, de is deceased, and uh, Dr. Murakami was practicing until he got harassed by the College of Physicians to stop diagnosing and treating Lyme disease. Now, that's the other thing, is the enforcement of this poor dogma that's been running our system on Lyme disease for the last two or three decades, is that now less than 2% of doctors are ever investigated by the College of Physicians and Surgeons, uh, their policing arm. We are now approaching 100% of Canadian doctors who have been sanctioned, either lost their license, forced into retirement just from harassment, uh, and as a consequence, all, almost all Canadians are left without an MD to treat Lyme disease. We're, we're luckier here in BC because since 2010, naturopathic doctors who have written and passed the provincial pharmacology exams are allowed to prescribe. And as a result now, we have some very uh, competent naturopathic doctors uh, treating Lyme disease very successfully. Yes? Is uh, there a dormant period at, at all, like particularly this time of the year with all the leaves falling? Uh, are the uh, ticks still active? Actually, this is a, a, a second peak period right now for uh, ticks. Um, there's really never any month of the year that you can be 100% safe that there's not going to be any ticks. Um, if you go out in your snowmobile or whatever and go gather wood to light yourself a fire to have some hot chocolate or something, uh, ticks are, will survive quite well under that snow and under that log and, and the debris around. 
uh, and they function quite well at anything above uh, minus seven. So actually there's two major tick seasons. There's one in the spring, May to the end of, uh, depending on where you are. The coast is earlier, uh, you know, goes by the, the temperature in the season. But typically there's a surge in the spring and then they go into a slower period. They do not like the dry heat of the summer, so they're not as active. Um, and then in the fall, with this kind of weather, there's another second peak. But there's never any one month of the year that you can be 100% sure you're not exposed. And of course, there are multiple hundreds of them on each year. Well, there can be. Um, it depends on the, re and the region. Uh, and um, the I talked to hunters who hang gear up and yeah, the, they drop, just drop off. Yeah, in years okay. past, those have been typically the der dermacenter tick, which does not transmit Lyme disease efficiently to humans. Uh, that's commonly called the Rocky Mountain wood tick, and it's the larger tick that probably anybody who's seen a tick in the past has probably seen the dermacenter uh, Amazonai tick, which is the Rocky Mountain wood tick, because it's far more common than the smaller Exodes tick. Um, <clears throat> now, uh, go back to the, uh, this here is the, um, the larva of the, of the uh, Exodes tick. As you can see, it's pretty darn tiny. And even there, it looks darker than it is in reality. And I have a vial here of uh, a bunch of these tiny little nymph ticks. In the past, up until recently, we didn't worry so much about the nymph because it was thought the egg, when, when they hatched from the egg, um, they were naive, in other words, they were not infected because uh, Borrelia burgdorferi does not pass transovarially, so it doesn't go from the mother tick to the egg. Now going, going ahead, and now our Borrelia miyamotoi that we have coast to coast to coast, as reported by Health Canada, it does transmit transovarially. So now these thousands of eggs are hatching these little speck-like larvae who are infective. And, um, and to what degree that's playing a role in, in, in Lyme disease across Canada, we have no idea. But one thing we do know is a ton of people have Lyme disease and have no recollection of ever being exposed to a tick. So was it that tiny little larva that if later you, you want to see them um, in the vial, you'll see they're, they're, they're quite flesh colored. And, and they're, only the size of a period at the end of a sentence. So uh, difficult to, to see. So we don't know how many people have actually been infected by Borrelia miyamoto or by these little loops. We have no idea whatsoever. I don't know I had all the procedures. And I took all that information to the doctor. I had the mark on my leg. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. And, and What's that's. The question? Oh, well, she was saying that she had all of the symptoms of Lyme disease. Yeah. She had the rash on her leg, went to the doctor, and the doctor poo-pooed it. And that was six years ago. Six years and, ago, yes. And I've been treated by an acupuncturist. Yeah. Which is probably first, and I got no worse. Yeah. So I never got better. R right, right. So you're in a maintenance period of bad health, but not yes. getting worse. So. You, what you need to do is find one of those treating naturopathic doctors. And there's uh, closest to you here would be that we know of. There may be one here in Grand Forks that I'm unaware of. And, and I apologize if there's a, a naturopath here that, that treats Lyme disease. But the closest one that I know of would be Sherry here in uh, Penticton and or Jeff Hunt who is in trail. He comes here. Yeah, I know. Okay. So he is able to prescribe and treat my disease. I don't, his experience isn't the same as others. Uh, there's much more experienced naturopaths, but, but I think Jeff consults 
with these other natural paths. Maybe he didn't when I first went to him. Maybe it's very, very possible. Yes. Yeah. It's a relatively new phenomenon for the natural paths. It's only been four years that they've even been allowed to prescribe, and not all of them jumped on that bandwagon of, of taking the pharmaceutical courses and whatnot. But from my understanding, is Jeff has since done that. Thank you. And so that that may be a very good contact. Yes. I was bitten about four months ago, yeah. and I did have the tick that was right on the back of my neck. It was still mm -hmm. alive and kept it. Mm -hmm. And we looked up in the BC Health Book to look for symptoms about what are we supposed to do, and it said, well, if there's a rash, and you start feeling about the flu, go to the emergency immediately. So two days later, I had a rash about this big on the back of my neck and a lump, and my husband said there was a little hole there. Mm -hmm. And I started to Feel like, I said, I just feel awful, all AP all over, like I'm getting the flu. So off we go to emergency. And the first statement was, there's no case ever been diagnosed in the whole of Western Canada of Lyme disease. <laughs> and I had the, the tick, and he says, that's not the kind of that tick. That was how long before, four months ago? Yes. And then he, I said, well, will you at least lance it and get that lump out of there so it doesn't spread to my brain or, you know, just in case. And he says, you are really being over dramatic. Oh. And then I said, well, we'll take a blood test. And he says, no, I don't want to put the system, the cost of the system, because you definitely don't have Lyme disease. You probably are getting the flu. Now that right there is malpractice. So then, I mean, I give them their due. All our symptoms are like the flu and, you know, and different things. So I, I said, well, what should I do? I just felt it lost, and he just, he just sent me home. I didn't know what to do, and I was you know, upset. I, and so now, like, suddenly after so many years, I'm getting these bad headaches. I think it my aches to move sometimes, but it's, you know, it's arthritis. Well, it's, it's everything else but Lyme. Yes, yeah, they, they'll yeah. come up with a million So what can we do to... Well, like I said, you're, well, you're another candidate that should get to one of these treating naturopaths and, and see if the diagnosis fits and uh, if they treat. Well, like somebody like Dr. Hunt, does he send off a blood test for them? Oh, he, yeah. Oh, absolutely. Right, yeah, right well, you can do that testing. alone. You don't need to wait for uh, some, a doctor to order the test. Uh, the, the test uh, that's most frequently used by Canadians is a lab called Igenix or Igenix. It's I-G-E-N-E-X. They're in Northern California. They refuse to follow that lousy CDC protocol of testing and confirming only Borrelia burgdorferi strain B31. They test with more strains. And over the past decade of us being in existence, um, we have found in terms of patient outcome, that lab to be the most beneficial to the patient. Uh, and we think from a microbiological perspective why that is, is they're also the only lab that we have been able to find in North America that is using a human-derived strain of the Lyme bacteria. It was removed from the cerebral spinal fluid of a woman in California. All of the other labs in, uh, in North America are using tick-derived strains of the bacteria. And the, you know, every person in, in entomology or microbiology understands that when bacteria, many bacteria, when they go from the uh, tick or whatever vector it is into the human, they often have to change their clothes to survive in the human caustic blood. And this is exactly what Lyme bacteria does. It, there has to be a, a feeding process with that tick and a, and a washing of the human blood with the mid-gut solution of the tick uh, um, in, in their inner gut. And with that washing triggers an enzyme which allows the Lyme bacteria to then change its clothes to put on this suit of armor it needs to survive in the human blood. So when it enters the human blood, you're not going to create an antibody response to the clothes it was wearing in the tick. You're going to create an antibody response to the clothes it has on when it's in the human. So it makes sense to use a human-derived strain of the Lyme bacteria. And perhaps, we can't say for sure, but perhaps that's why they're having better results. Um, but you can call Igenix 
uh, igenix.com is their uh, website. CanLive receives nothing from Igenix. We have just found uh, our goal is to help patients, and in terms of patient outcome, they are by far and away the better lab that we have found so far. Is one doomed when you're bitten by a tick, or does nope. the immune system sometimes kick in and prevent you? Well, you know, in, in some people there seems to be the ability to keep this thing in, in a check. Uh, like we do millions of bacteria, our immune systems are keeping in check all the time. <clears throat> and the reason I say that is there has been human studies of outdoor workers, for example, where there's evidence that quite a percentage of the outdoor workers have been exposed to the Lyme bacteria, but a much smaller percentage are actually showing symptoms. Um, but will that person later show symptoms? Will that person later develop MS or Lou Gehrig's disease or a form of Parkinson's or uh, chronic fatigue or lupus or Alzheimer's? Uh, when I did my shopping for scientists, when I started CanLime, I found uh, Dr. Judith McClossey, uh, a, a PhD scientist working at the Kinsman Neurologic Research Institute at UBC. And I had read her papers with great interest. I think the first one I read was in 1993, where she took 10 brains from the Alzheimer's Harvard Brain Bank and uh, analyze them using DNA technology, looking for the Lyme bacteria. And uh, of that, she found seven out of 10 of those brains had the Lyme bacteria in She followed that research with you know, taking the Lyme bacteria and introducing it to healthy brain tissue in the Petri dish to see if that would cause the brain tissue to form these deadly amyloid plaques that destroy the tissue in Alzheimer's. And sure, sure enough, after a week, she had a full moon amyloid plaques in big tissue. So she published that, and uh, very little interest in it. Um, so and later on, uh, she took uh, more brains. And she didn't just limit it to the Lyme disease spirochete. She looked at the whole spirochete family, or as many as she could have primers and folks for. So she was able to look at the, the dental spirochete that can cause periodontal disease, periodontal disease. There's a gut, uh, Borrelia, uh, Borrelia that uh, lives in our gut, and treponema that lives in our gut. Treponema is of the family that causes syphilis. That's the same family that can cause periodontal disease. Um, so what, when she did this further research, she found that uh, over 90% of Alzheimer's brains had a spiroketosis. So they were infected with one of these strains and species of uh, spiroketal bacteria. Dr. Judith McClossey is uh, now back in Switzerland, uh, her native country, uh, at Lausanne University, and she runs now the Alzheimer's Research Foundation in Europe. And um, so are these people with uh, showing no infection when they're young, are they our future Alzheimer's patients? Is it part of the process that triggers some of these autoimmune type, uh, other progressive illnesses that we have? Um, we think, yes, there is a role there. We just, we can't say every case of Alzheimer's is Lyme disease. We can only say that, look at, you know, there's a relationship there, and can we prevent Lyme disease by perhaps treating, or prevent Alzheimer's by treating Lyme in many people. How do animals deal with this bacteria? Are all they just carriers? Like all are, all deer? differently. Deer, but they do have a reaction. Deer not, blood, no, deer not blood just a carrier. Kills Deer, deer, so deers are, deer are not affected by Lyme. Okay, what about our pets? What about the mice? It affects dogs uh, severely. Yeah. Can, it, it can kill a dog. Kidneys shut down, uh, liver issues. Um, so again, our dogs could have Lyme disease and we'd never know why they died. Right. Yeah. Actually, we have a better time in Canada 
getting diagnosed if you're a dog, <laughs> then you can <laughs> Veterinarians, uh, just by their very nature of their business, have had to be more open to just about every aspect of science because they're dealing with the, with the immune system of a dog, of a horse, of a cat, of a this. They can't just send everything off to the specialist. Yeah. So they gotta deal with what they got. And uh, so as a result of that, they're, they, they're much more open to the science and uh, a dog comes in with these symptoms. Most vets now across Canada are aware enough that, uh, in fact, there's a, uh, test put out uh, by um, IDEX, and it's a, it's a snap test, in other words, it's something that can be done right in the office, and it's, it's a combination of tests, it tests for Lyme disease, uh, heartworm, um, perhaps, or Linky, I forget what's all included in it, um, but anyhow, the, the vets have that. And then you give a dog a Lyme test, it's still not going to catch all the Lyme disease because it, it's a form of the screening test, only it's a broader form than, than what's typically used in the BC CDC. In fact, the test the dogs are given was developed for humans. But it's only licensed in Canada, was only ever licensed in Canada for dogs. So we should go to a vet? <laughs> <laughs> Our blood off yeah. and get a proper <laughs> <laughs> um, so, what if uh, Bill C 442 is passed? What would be the changes in Canada? Or BC? All right, now Bill C 442 is a private member's bill. Private member's bills cannot compel government to spend a lot of money. So they have to be written in such a way that not only will they pass, but they'll have as much impact as they can. And I think this bill achieves as much as it can. And what it's done is it's gotten, forces the hand of the federal government to meet with the patient and their experts, have them at the table for this discussion, have them at the table for, and put on this uh, conference, a national conference, and contribute to a report that within one year of the conference, there has to be a, a report written written by the Health Canada, Public Health Agency of Canada, and submitted to the House of Commons. Um, so what that does is, the most important thing that does is gives the victims and their experts for the first time a voice at that level. Because if you go back through the history, since Diane Kindry started Lyme, the, the Lyme Borreliosis Society in BC, and predating that by a decade, the Lyme societies in the United States, who have been butting heads with this huge mammoth mega medical money machine that we've created, um, we're, we're now, all the science is coming out is showing that the patients had it right all along. So we don't need white coats who never had Lyme disease, who have only been trained in one direction on Lyme disease. We have to refuse from here forward to allow them to be the only ones setting the policies for us, mm -hmm. the victims. And uh, it's funny, in, the, in our, like, each branch of the government, federal government, has to go annually to our treasury board to access tax dollars to get funded for the, for the following year. Now in, in that process, there's certain requirements they have to meet. One of the requirements for the Public Health Agency of Canada and Health Canada is that they must liaise with the stakeholders on the disease. Well, for decade upon decade, the only stakeholders were other health departments, uh, other professional medical associations, the pharmaceutical industry, the vaccine manufacturers, the medical device manufacturers, and anybody else who can make a profit from, from our health care. The most important stakeholder in any illness is the victim. And yet they have never been allowed to sit at that policy-making table and no matter how many experts we put forward, Sorry, well, we're going to make the decisions here, but out. And uh, 
Now, th this bill has already started that communication, and hence why we're now in, in quarterly meetings with the federal, uh, with the executives of the federal health, uh, the public health agency of Canada. And that wasn't us. Um, and we got a call. The call came to Rosanna McNaughton, one of uh, our board members in Ontario, from the chief operating officer of the public health agency. Canada saying we want to meet. And that was shortly after we put out our joint press release between Canline and the G. Magnata Foundation. Rosanna Magnata owns quite a large winery in uh, Ontario and in Chile. Her husband Gabe uh, was one of the founding members and uh, he died in December 2009 after his battle. So the G. Magnata Foundation has, has been formed and we put out a press release in um, May of uh, 2013 that we had been working with the executive of the Humber River Hospital Network in Ontario to develop a human tissue study program and we're working with scientists on four different continents to do that. As soon as that press release went out, three weeks later we get the call from uh, the COO of the Public Health Agency of Canada and saying we want to meet. So that was very important for us. But also, was it the, the, the fact that the bill was looking like it was getting so much support? Or was it a combination of the bill looking like it's getting support and the fact that we're working with scientists around the world to do a very unique human tissue study program using the highest technology that there is available today in DNA detection. And we're going to use patient groups, all of those that I just mentioned, MS and Alzheimer's and Garrett's disease and chronic fatigue and fibromyalgia and lupus. So, and the health officials understand the capability of today's technology. And when one Genome Canada funded scientist uh, was giving me an analogy of comparing what we can do with DNA today using shotgun sequencing and whatnot and, and with our computer capacity that wasn't even there five years ago. Um, <clears throat> he said like the, the test that the BCCDC is using right now is sort of like running a magnet over a haystack looking for a rusty needle. Well, it may or may not find it. And there's many variables that go into that as to whether it might. Um, this new technology said though, not only will you immediately find the needle in the haystack, you'll find, you'll be able to identify every piece of straw in the haystack and every microorganism on every piece of straw in the haystack. So that was a pretty powerful uh, statement and that really, really got my attention. So this is extremely powerful technology. So if I um, go to any, the doctor here at Grand Forks um, to get a test for Lyme disease at some point, I think I can bid. Yeah. Um, where, which lab is that blood test going to? Where, where does it go? It's just not, your standard one? Yeah. It's at the BC Center for Disease Control. Which is a total waste of time. Right? And, and I know we always recommend people get it because, uh, you know, they detected 13 last year, I think. <laughs> if you're one of the lucky people, at least they can't deny it, you know. So at least do get that test done and insist on it. Don't take no from your doctor. It's your health. Take control of it. But if I, if I go to Spokane and I have a test there, does that test end up at the Igenics lab in California? No. 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 Okay. No, there's, okay, there's mainstream medicine and then there's alternative or out-of-the-box medicine. Uh, I, those are the thinkers that actually help you. And um, I, I'm just mainstream going. medicine, if you go to Spokane, most GPs in Spokane will use the same testing procedure that you're getting done at the BC Center for Disease Control because it's the United States Center for Disease Control that set that lousy criteria. 
and the Infectious Disease Society. So you still have to have wise thinking doctors. It's just that in the United States, it isn't institutionalized as it is in Canada. So there are better thinkers. I'm confused because under, you know, under our skin, yeah. it, the map that shows the incidence of reported Lyme disease shows a map of the United States and a map of Canada. And in the United States, it's blocked out with black dots. And then above the border, you know, you get a dot here, here, and there. And they said the reason that the so if you think you have Lyme disease, the best thing to do is go to the states to get a test. Not go to the states. Pick up the phone. Yeah. Call one of these labs, like Igenix. Okay. Or if you don't want like Igenix, call the New York State Lab. It's a much bigger test than what uh, you can the BC. You know you just call the lab. Yeah, well, you can. You can Google search, and I think uh, the links are even on our website. Labs. Um, you just call them, and, and okay. Igenix. Uh, what is that? Yeah. She's uh, left, I guess. But I, I had a, a product test kit for, for her down. But you can call Igenix. They'll send you one in the mail. It doesn't cost you a thing to get the kit. Um, and then when the kit arrives, it's got the paperwork for you to fill out for your personal information, uh, your credit card information, um, and a place for a local GP or, or MD to, to sign to have your blood drawn. Typically, in most cases, you take that kit once the doctor has signed to have your blood drawn to where you would ever where where you would go normally to get your blood drawn. Typically, it's all handled from there. You take this kit in, it's all there for the lab to put the, the vials are in it, to put the blood in, the fixing agents are in the vials. Um, and um, they'll, the lab will pull FedEx, get the shipping charge back to California, charge you that. They'll charge you a blood draw fee because they can't get any of this back through the BC healthcare system. Uh, and then when the test is completed at whatever lab you select, that's when your credit card is, is uh, but the test that we usually recommend uh, ranges from $330 to about $575, $600, depending on shipping and family charges. Um, it could be the best money you ever spent if you're sick. And it's unfortunate that we can't get it done right here, though, under our social system. Now, uh, I'm going to bring up uh, one of the most <laughs> unique <laughs> examples of how to remove a tick. So come on up. It's very creative. <laughs> well, you have to show something visual. Uh, just, my name's Gary, my wife has a uh, line. That's okay. Um, and we're not hired by Canline, although it'd be nice to have a, a steady job, but... Uh, <laughs> we're not hired by me too. Yes, we have But uh, the reason we do this kind of thing is to get the word out to people. Um, we attend, you know, farmers markets and information. We're at the Rock Creek Fair. And simply because we had such a fight to find where to go. What do we do now that we found it? And in the fight, as you say, we were victims twice. Once because you get the disease, second because of the ignorance of the doctors we talked to that it was, a, it was an MS specialist in Kelowna, I won't mention his name, but um, I asked him, knowing that it could be possibly Lyme disease that Sue had, because she was misdiagnosed with MS originally, I said, could it possibly be Lyme disease? He all but jumped across the table and said, no, it doesn't exist in Canada, and only 2% ever get it. It's not Lyme disease. I thought, oh, okay, this conversation is over. We went through it anyway. So anyway, sent the, sent the test off, came back positive, yes. So she's now undergone treatment after four and a half years of suffering and getting worse and worse and worse. She's now getting better and better and better, okay? But it's been two and a half years in treatment, so it takes a while. You know, it's not instant by all means. But anyway, so one thing we, we do when we're at the uh, the various farmer and markets and things is people, because we have samples of ticks over there, they're, they're dormant. I won't say they're dead, because <laughs> if you think they're dead, put them on your arm, okay? I'm not gonna put them on mine. We also have a, a nymph to show you how small it is, okay? And we try and get people to collect them because it's amazing to see the sizes of these things in real life and the ones that are around, well, the Okanagan anyway. But the one question I always ask people is, okay, so if you're out in the, the woods, you've got a hike, you've you know, got the wood for the winter, and you find a tick embedded in you, how do you remove it? And I hear all kinds of horror stories from 
you know, lit cigarette to Vaseline to all of that kind of stuff. Okay, you know, old wives' tales may have worked in in the, you know Stone Age time, but that's not the way to do it. And this is why, when a tick burrows down into you, it does some a couple of things. First of all, it put it puts an anesthetic in, so you can't feel it going in. Okay. So when it's inside you, when it's down, its mouth parts are inside your skin. So there's its mouth, okay, and its body's on the outside. It buries itself up to as far as it can get, okay. So the thing is, if you put a uh, burnt cigarette, a match, um, anything like that, it'll tend to vomit, which injects inside you whatever was in the stomach contents. That'll probably be the bacteria. If you go like this to pick it off, which a lot of people do, I just pull it off my fingers, you've just injected it into yourself. So don't do that either. The best thing to do, and now obviously, if you find a tick this large on you, <laughs> mm, you have a real problem. But anyway, so you get, get yourself a, a, a fine needle nose tweezers. These are large. Okay, they're not just an example of a smaller one. And in the tick kits, they have tiny, tiny ones that allow you to do what you need to do. So what you do is come in as close to the skin as you can between the tick body and your skin. First of all, pinch it off. You've just closed off the, the throat, basically. So now it can't regurgitate into you. And then all you do is just pull slow and steady. The thing is, it'll look just like this, coming out of your skin. And hopefully, you'll get all the mouth parts. There won't be anything left inside, OK? The thing is, people also see um, sort of a whitish material here. They think that's skin. It isn't. It's actually super glue. Because when they burrow in, they secrete a glue that's around the injection site, I'll call it, that to glue themselves in so you don't accidentally brush them off, because that would be too easy. But that's the best method for right there, not, not those other ones. Exactly. Thanks, Barry. So that's a, that's a really good visual, and it's, it's so important that you know that technique. You don't want to affect yourself. So, uh, I think that's probably it, and I just want to thank everybody for, for coming out today. Thanks for all the good questions. I just want to thank you for your work. Oh, yeah. well, affected my life and my uh, my daughter is now walking around with a permanent pacemaker for the rest of her life. And, uh, and there's horror stories right across Canada. So the only thing that was rare about this disease in Canada wasn't the disease, it was the diagnosis. So thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming.